Wednesday will be the men's Bible study at 7 o'clock. Um, all right, let's say our songs together. Blessed, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. That bringeth forth his fruit in his season, his leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. By the time we're done with Psalms will have that all done. Oh, come on, look at my stuff here. <laughs> I'm so prepared. Please take your Bibles, turn to uh, How about second. whiter than snow? Uh -huh. How about whiter than snow? Oh, let's sing a song. Okay. Stand together, let's sing this hymn together, Whiter Than Snow.
Samuel chapter 12 is the background of Psalm 51, so I wanted to read that for you. <clears throat> Actually, you probably should read 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 12 to get the whole story. That's something you can do on your own. In 2 Samuel 12, and the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him and said unto him, there were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing, save one little ewe, lamb, which he had bought and nourished up, and it grew up together with him and with his children, and it did eat of his own meat and drank his own cup and lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take uh, of his own flock and of his own herd to dress. That's a nice thing. Yeah, okay. This doesn't sound right. To dress for the wayfaring man that was come unto him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. David's anger was kindled, greatly kindled against the man. He said, Nathan, as the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this shall surely die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. I gave thee thy master's house, thy master's wives into thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and hast taken his wife to be thy wife, and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me, and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will rise up evil against thee out of thine own house. I will take thy wives before thine eyes and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of the son. For thou didst it secretly, but I do this thing before all Israel and before the son. And the David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord hath put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. We're going to stop right there. And that's you can read the rest of it yourself, 
and read 11 too to see what was actually going on at that time. And But we'll be looking at Psalm 51 this morning. May God bless us as we embrace this passage of scripture. And uh, as we go to prayer this morning, let's continue to pray for um, Matt Dorak and uh, Mary as well. And for Elaine and Keith and for Gerard and his friend Matt and uh, um, Art and Louise are not here this morning. Let's pray for them. Of course, continue to pray for Jimmy and his kids and Tony and his kids. Um, I'll pray for Stefan and Rebecca. Uh, they're on the field. Uh, to my to my knowledge, they're there now. I haven't heard from them since the last time, so let's continue to pray for them. Uh, language acquisition and uh, uh, I think that's the hardest part of the, and of course the uh, they're newlyweds as well, and he's a tough nut too, so she's going to have a hard road. You know? so, I don't think he's going to hear this. Sorry, Stephen. <laughs> We're good friends. Anyway, and let's see. All right, anybody have a prayer request? Pray for our church, you know. Um, ah, hey, we should be used to this by now, but. We have quite a few people out for sickness and other reasons, and we need to pray for them. And uh, we need to pray that our church will grow. Mm -hmm. And uh, God has his hand in that, obviously. But uh, uh, we need to be faithful while we're serving here. And I'm not talking about me and Margaret only. All of us serve here and uh, in whatever capacity, sharing the gospel, etc. So uh, pray for our government as well. And uh, uh, obviously pray for Israel. I think that's about it. All right, let's pray. Father, we're thankful for this time, and we're uh, uh, thankful for those who were able to make it today, and we uh, miss the ones that haven't come, and we pray for them. Pray for Matt as he continues to gain his strength, and one day he'll be back with us, and Mary as well. Pray for uh, Keith and Elaine as well, Father, as they're on the mend, and we uh, pray for uh, Raj and Ronnie, and uh, for others, Father, that uh, aren't feeling well and couldn't make it with us today. And Lord, we pray for those that you have for us that might come from the community. We pray for our uh, ministry and our witnessing, Father, that we would see fruit. Your will, of course, and uh, we'll just serve as best we can, Father. Uh, we pray, Father, that you would just uh, lead and direct in our steps. Pray for uh, um, Justine as she works and for Gerard and his uh, knee problem, back problems, and other things, Father, and that you would just be with them. And uh, we pray for Stefan and uh, Rebecca, Lord, that you would just keep them safe and uh, richly bless them in their ministry and in their uh, learning the language as well. And we pray for our government, Father, and uh, we pray for our country and our future. And of course, we pray for the Israelites and we pray for that, that whole section over there, Lord, that you would just be with them. Of course, you are and uh, we, we just give you the praise for all things. In Jesus' precious name, amen. amen. <clears throat> it's interesting when you uh, uh, try to understand the concept of praying for Israel, because Israel right this moment, uh, many of them uh, reject Jesus as the Messiah. And, uh, you know, uh, they're Jewish people. But uh, we have to understand what the Bible talks about as praying for Israel. And Israel have his, God will have his way with Israel one day. And uh, um, our country is one of the only allies Israel has left, if that's even true today. So we really need to pray for them and uh, the unrest we have in our own country. So it's a big order, but we know that God's in complete control and that uh, uh, there should be no worry about what's going to happen. We know that he's going to have his way with us and our country and the world in his timing. Let's sing another great hymn, uh, Have Thine Own Way, Lord always kind of falls right into place.
51, please. I want to talk about the elements of uh, true repentance and uh, David's uh, debacle here. Uh, we'll look at in Psalm 51. Uh, there's uh, to the chief musician a psalm of David, um, and this uh, preface is there. It was added uh, afterwards, but part of the passage sometimes it gives you uh, some information, especially if you were going to lead this in a hymn in some synagogue somewhere. There's notes to the musician. Uh, sometimes it's uh, both vocal and uh, musician, uh, just instrumental. Uh, but it says a psalm of David. Uh, there are those that uh, question whether David actually wrote this or was attributed to him. And uh, in my mind, it doesn't really matter. It says a psalm of David, which uh, to me is a psalm about David. Um, one of the things that you'll find very quickly as you read scripture is that uh, the truth is never hidden. And when uh, someone did something bad and it was recorded scripture was record exactly what happened. Perhaps David might not want to share this, uh, especially uh, what, what went on, and I'm sure other people uh, knew about it and were affected by it. But if you were to take 2 Samuel um, chapter 11 and 12 together, you would get the bigger picture of what uh, David did. Now, David was considered uh, God beloved. He was anointed as king. I read this for you. God reminds him of all that he did. And if he needed anything, God would have supplied anything he had. So uh, the, the story that Nathan gave to David, you remember David was a shepherd, so sheep were um, uh, close to his heart. He wrote uh, Psalm 23. And uh, uh, this is the only story that we find that in that culture, uh, a person had an animal that was their pet. Uh, most of the animals were uh, raised for food and for uh, wool and stuff. But uh, I think, uh, obviously, inspired by the Holy Spirit, Nathan tweaked this to really make it sound terrible, which it was, at the rich man. And this really kind of goes along with how the world really is. Those who have a lot don't want to give up anything they have, and they want what you have. Seems very similar to our government today. They're very happy to spend your money, but don't. And I, I noticed that, and it's in record, you can look at the, what I classify as the wrong side, and uh, they, they're they very uh, non-generous in their giving. They make millions and they give very little. And on the right side, you'll see those people are very generous in their giving. And uh, it really kind of is a bottom line between dark and lightness, as far as good and evil and the world and all this. What we're looking at here is David as a believer. Now, there's a difference between him and us because of the cross. If you're a believer today, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit. You accepted that free gift. In the Old Testament economy, those that were classified as believers believed in God and in the revelation that God had given it to them. For the Jewish person, that was placing their efforts into the Levitical system. And, of course, we find in the scriptures that God's intent was that the sacrificial system was a picture of what would be accomplished on the cross, but he wanted them to really um, be a part of it, not just go through the motions. And we find in the Old Testament that that's kind of what they were guilty of. Not necessarily <clears throat> putting their heart into it, but just going through the motions, and God didn't want that as well. So what we have in this passage is elements of... Uh, what repentance is all about because in our day and age a lot of the churches today that are we would classify as postmodern churches uh, they have kind of tweaked the gospel into you know just mumble some words and go back to your seat and you're good to go and uh, there's really no need for um, repentance you know they don't want to use words that will disturb those people about sin etc but in this passage God brings out the, the importance of understanding sin. And David uses three different um, 
classifications for sin. And uh, we have uh, transgressions, which implies rebellion against God's authority. Iniquity, which means a distortion of what should be. And then the word sin itself is missing the mark. We kind of understand that from the definition of uh, um, sin in the New Testament is missing that mark. But the definition of sin is designed so that we understand the responsibility of the one that sins. And uh, David says in, um, let's see, <clears throat> right in the first verse, he says, O God, according to thy loving kindness, loving kindness, Loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Now there's some interesting terms used as we look at this passage. The uh, loving kindness is, and you know, I can give you the Hebrew word, it wouldn't really matter, but it, it's almost the picture of what we would look at as, in the New Testament, in Koine Greek, is charis, grace. And he's looking for God's grace in this case. There's nothing he can do about it. And he uses the uh, idea of uh, tender mercies. The word blot is a really familiar passage. That would be something that's eradicated from a page. Like your name is blotted out. You're no longer there. So he's looking at only God is capable of removing this sin, uh, this transgression. So we have the d definition of sin. And... Uh, one of the things that we understand, and I hope that you do well, is one of the ministries of the Holy Spirit is conviction. And not I'm convicted, you know, um, that this is right, this is wrong. The Holy Spirit's ministry of conviction is revealing to you uh, your sin. And uh, true conviction will hound you. David talks about this. His sin was ever before him. There was no way to forget it. It was always on his mind. Because what we're looking at is, uh, what does the Bible say about uh, real repentance? Because a lot of times Christians will say, you know, I'm saved and all this stuff, but they really have not captured the understanding of forgiveness. Because uh, uh, the Bible tells us that our sins are forgiven. The Bible describes God's relationship to that as he cast it farthest from the east to the west. It's no longer there. But many times people will rehearse and ask for forgiveness over and over about something they had done in the past. And uh, um, I'm guilty of that as well. Not necessarily asking for forgiveness because I understand that, but the feeling of guilt for something you've done. Even the Apostle Paul felt guilty for going after the church prior to the road to Damascus. So that there's uh, the uh, difficulty for us to get around this guilt. A couple of months of, well, it could have been weeks now, but uh, we, I talked about something and read this article about 98% of people that are institutionalized for mental illness is uh, the core problem is their un, unability, inability to handle guilt. And so uh, you might think that um, unsaved people have no guilt, but they go through guilt as well. And uh, it's hard for them to deal with it. A lot of times they deal with it through other sources, drugs, alcohol, etc., cetera, like that. But um, as believers, when the Spirit convicts us, there's a need for us to take care of this. This is what we're looking at with David. Luke chapter 18, 13 says, God be merciful to me, um, the sinner, a sinner. The phrase has mercy literally means to be propitiated toward me. So if you were to look at the Septuagint in this passage, you would see that, uh, that translation terminology there. Uh, it's a big word. It just means that God takes care of it so it is, he's satisfied for the payment of the debt. When Christ died on the cross, his blood was shed. And so that, that gift that we accept freely takes care of our sin problem. It appeases God's wrath. So true repentance begins with an acknowledgement that we've sinned. There are a lot of times people justify their sin. They, and we see that in the TV all the time. Well, the guy, yeah, he did kill him, but you got to understand he was from the wrong side of the tracks. He didn't have a father, you know, and, uh, you know, he was sleeping in class when they were talking about ethics. I don't know. But uh, we, we find ourselves 
justifying behavior. And uh, nowhere in the Bible does it dilute the potency of sin. And uh, especially in this case, it says, you know, in verse 1 there, um, after he had gone into Bathsheba, he had committed adultery. Matter of fact, he committed murder. You might say, well, wait a second. He just told them to place him in the Uriah in a place and then move back and let the enemy kill him. So he didn't actually shoot the arrow. Now, the Bible says sword, but if you read back in 2 Samuel, you know, uh, one of the things you learned as a soldier is don't get too close to the wall because they're up there shooting arrows at you. And uh, that's exactly what happened. A lot of people died that day. And uh, as I studied the passage, it almost seemed like there were others that died with your hot Uriah that didn't need to die. They were put placed in a situation and then the troops removed themselves. They were chasing them to the city. And uh, the normal um, statistician would have stopped that and regrouped to attack the city because it's a different kind of attack. And this is what happened. But God sees it as David's hand on the sword. Matter of fact, later in the passage, we find that his household from then on had the sword. That's why Solomon had to build the temple because David was a man of blood. Now, Nathan, in the beginning, which seems kind of confusing, but you have to understand the sequences of time that sometimes gets lost in the translation. But Nathan told David that God had forgiven him of that sin, which equaled that David wasn't going to die right then. Which, when you think about it, uh, a lot of times God dealt a blow uh, that was severe for that kind of sin. But God had a plan for him. So forgiveness is a postponement of judgment sometimes. And in this case, we know that... Um, David's uh, son through this union with Bathsheba, that son was taken because of his sin. Uh, someone once wrote that uh, you might sin, but it never affects just you. It affects other people in your lives. And uh, that's one of the things that we have to really weigh as we negotiate life as believers because we have a sin nature. Now, how easy it is to sin? It's easier to sin than not sin sometimes, you know. Um, and uh, so that's something that we should have always in the front of our mind because what we're trying to do is not necessarily be perfect or holier than thou, but we're trying to please the Father. And uh, to please the Father, we don't want to put anything in the way of his presence in our lives. And sin is the number one uh, factor that gets in the way. So conviction is something that we have to deal with. Conviction is the idea of a consciousness knowing that it's not my society, it wasn't my wife, because, you know, the blame game comes up in the scenario. And I, I have a list of uh, famous uh, blames, you know, starting with Adam. It was the wife that you gave me. So Adam is blaming God for this whole thing. And then there's others that I'll give you in a few moments. But he uses some uh, terminology in verse 2. Um, he says, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. We have a similar verse in the New Testament in uh, 1 John 1, 9. And that, that says, if I acknowledge or confess my sin, he is faithful and just to cleanse me from all my unrighteousness. And uh, see, as a believer, our sins are taken care of at the cross, past, present, and future. But as a human with an old nature, we have a propensity to sin, which is like getting filthy. David describes this as, wash me thoroughly uh, from my iniquity and cleanse me. Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 22 gives us some understanding here in this. It helps us to see the intensity of David's plea. It says, though you wash yourself with lye and use much soap, the stain of your guilt is before me. There's no detergent around that can remove all the stains. We can't clean ourselves up. So what David is asking is for God to wash him. When I was a uh, teenager in our youth group, I'm not sure if it was my brother or Ron at that time, but the youth leader had this great idea. We're going to wash each other's feet in the summertime. You know, boys wear sneakers 24-7. So 
picking a sneaker off in a smelly sock and making somebody wash it was a demeaning thing. And uh, he got the point across. Even in the first century, um, the custom was if I had you over for lunch, I'd have a servant wash your feet because of the dust and all that stuff. Because when you sat at the table, your feet were right next to the table because the tables were low on the ground and you kind of sat down on pillows. I don't know how it worked for the old people, but I don't think it would be a good idea today. Get down, you might not be able to get back up. But uh, that was the culture of that time. But the concept of washing is something that we should kind of keep in our minds because that's a better way of looking at it, not necessarily drawing a picture of a, like um, a, a schedule of what's good sin and what bad sins. All sins are bad. There's no good kind of sins and not so bad sins. Any sin will uh, separate you from God's presence. And, you know, adultery is a big deal. That's a big, bad sin. And David paid the price for it. But uh, lying and cheating and forsaking and just list it down. It's all there. Sin is sin. And uh, so our understanding of that will help us. Um, so that we are safeguarding ourselves. Look at your life and think about what, what in your life helps you along the way to sin. Because we're all different, right? What, what gets in the way of your uh, service to God? Work? Uh, pleasure? You know, whatever it is. Because... Um, what it gets in your way might not be in my way. So it's not a, let's make a list and we'll just follow this list, legalism. It doesn't work. Because the Bible says what you think is sin is sin to you. But it might not be to me. You know, you might not like, well, I'm not going to use an example. So that mm -hmm. it's here and there. The sensitivity of sin is developed in our response to the word of God. The Holy Spirit's ministry to convict us. Uh, that should be something that should be, we should work on heightening that experience. Not allowing it to be callous to the point where we don't recognize it ever again. Uh, that's the danger that happens a lot of times. So we have to be sensitive to that. And it's very difficult in our lives because we're surrounded by sin. Everything is sinful. You know, even programs that we watch, I, I find myself going back to old shows, uh, Parent Trap. I think my wife is sick of watching that because I can watch the whole show and there's nothing in it. I can watch it. There's no innuendos. There's no cursing, nothing uh, that I can think of. Oh, there is smoking in the old one, right? <laughs> well, anyway, so go figure that. But, you know, um, probably shut the thing off would be better, but I've kind of been accustomed to that anyway in my whole life. William Carey was a missionary, and uh, I remember studying him in college, and I felt bad for him. The father of modern missions um, once was asked what passage he wanted to share at his funeral. He said, oh, I feel that uh, such a poor, sinful creature is unworthy to have anything said about him. Uh, he said, but if a funeral sermon must be preached, let it be from the words, have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgression. So William Carey quoted from Psalm 51, in the same spirit of humility, he directed in his will to have uh, these words inscribed on his tombstone. You go to England now and still see that. It says, a wretched, poor, and helpless worm, on thy kind arms I fall. Eh, okay. Sounds a little crazy, but um, humility comes when you understand who you are in, in light of who God is and what he has accomplished. There should be no pride in anything. Now, don't misunderstand me. Taking pride in your work is a good thing. When Jimmy hooked up the wires, I want him to have pride in that. Not, ah, you know what, let's do the color thing here. I don't like white, I'll just put a pink here, you know. And, uh, you know, someone gets a surprise when they hit the switch. That's different. This is, look how good I am, and you need me. There are a lot of arrogance in the pulpit. Pastors who have huge congregations somehow, somewhere down the line, think that it was them that did this, and they swell up. And uh, usually somewhere down the road, they fall on their faces. 
But uh, I don't wish that on anybody. And I recognize where Paul was coming from when he uh, understood after the after his uh, meeting with Christ uh, how he felt about himself because of what he had done and how he gave God the glory from from saving him from doing that and uh, all the things around that. So as believers, uh, there should be no uh, pride, you know, about uh, how good you are at whatever you do. Uh, other than the fact that you take pride in your work. Sorry, I beat that horse to death. Let's go to verse 3. Uh, David shows us how deeply convicted he was about his sin. He says, for I know, for I acknowledge, I'm aware of my transgression. And that, remember I said that, that means rebellious act. I'm forever conscious of my sin. It says, my sin is before me always. Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, and that thou mightst be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. And so David uh, goes from a transition from uh, conviction to confession, found in verse 4 through 6, after being, um, and I use this word busted, so you cops out there understand, he got busted. I think the kids use that phrase as well when they get caught by a mom or dad doing something. Uh, right, Dylan? <laughs> he says, uh, after being busted about his sins, David is now ready to confess them. In verse 4, I believe, based on the passage, that this conviction was a process that was eating at him. Uh, there's another song that says his bones grew weak because of the sin that was before him. And uh, David uh, uh, acknowledged that it was against God. And uh, you only have I sinned and done this evil thing. It reminds me of what Joseph said to Potiphar's wife when he chose purity over impurity in Genesis 39.9. Part of the verse says, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against, not Potiphar, but against God? See, our understanding of sin is that when we sin, we violate God's law. It affects other people. It affects ourselves. But God is aware of that sin. Somebody said too many of us put our own spin on sin, but we must come clean without conditions. Those of us who play the blame game. Oh, here's my list now. Um, let's see, the blame game. We'll start with Adam and Eve, right? Genesis 3. The woman gave me some fruit of the tree, and I ate it. He immediately reacted as was to deny personal responsibility. Adam's attempt to shift the blame was even more involved than this. When pressed by God to give an answer as to why he did what he did, Adam said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit. <clears throat> Unbelievably, Adam uh, tried to blame God. David's credit, he doesn't do that as evidenced by what we read so far so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgments, which is actually quoted in Romans chapter 3. It didn't take Eve long to learn how to play the game, and so she blamed the serpent. Uh, John MacArthur said, this is an unequivocal confession of his extreme and supreme sinfulness. He gives no excuses, no explanations, no rationale. In short, David is saying to God, I'm wrong, you're right. And that's the bottom line. You know, you can, you know, I was doing so good when my wife bought chocolate ice cream and put it before me and, and put a spoon in my hand, you know, and uh, almost... I thought she was forcing me to eat it. That's kind of what we do with sin, you know. I, I just was at a weak point, and, you know, the guy offered me, and uh, I didn't know what to do, and I didn't want to hurt his feelings, so I sinned, you know. And it goes down the line. Uh, Martin Luther said, when commenting on his best, he said that in, instead of confessing our own sins, we like to confess the sins of others. I've heard this. Well, I'm not as bad as, uh, uh, what was his name? No, I can't remember his name. Uh, you know, from Helter Skelter. I'm not as bad as Charles Manson. And most of you young people wouldn't know who that is, but he was quite a criminal. There's quite a few more that you could use if you wanted to go that route. And, you know, we like to confess the sins of others. I perceive the sins of others, and the sins of others are always before me, David says. Unfortunately, too many of us think our sins smell better than theirs. And uh, yeah. I'm not going to tell you who said that. But verse 5 now, look at verse 5. Behold, I was shaped in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Now, it kind of sounds like 
his mother was uh, a floozy, but that's not what he's saying. He says, uh, in, his, in the mother's womb, in conception, he was conceived with a sin nature. A sinner, the moment my mother conceived me, I was a sinner. And if you go back to Genesis, God says that because of Adam's sin, all men have sinned through Adam. And Romans talks about that as well. I think I wrote that down somewhere. But behold, I was shaped in iniquity. So there's an understanding of the propensity of sin in David's life. And, uh, but when he was convicted of it, it he, he, he did something that we need to learn about. In his conviction, uh, in his confession, uh, there was no element of blame. Um, yeah, I'll skip that part. There's a, a corporate element to confession. And uh, uh, Second Chronicles, if my people who call by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I'll forgive their sin and heal their land. I read an article about a church that the congregation got together and confessed this uh, before God as a group and looking for God to bless their church once again. And so there's an element there, but in uh, this section here, we're looking at it from a personal section. Uh, Daniel chapter 9, Daniel says, I turned my face to the Lord God, seeking him by prayer and pleas for mercy and fasting and sackcloth and ashes. I pray to the Lord my God and made confession, saying, O oh Lord, the great, awesome God who keeps the covenant and steadfast love with those who love him. And the prayer goes on because David's including himself with the people of Israel. So we have uh, elements of that throughout Scripture. Ezra does the same thing um, in uh, 9 6. Uh, but uh, the confession, uh, so we have the um, conviction. The second step is the confession. And then the third step is the cleansing, found in verse 7 um, through 12. Purge me with hyssop. Hyssop was kind of like a medicinal plant branch. Uh, we're familiar with it because that was what was used to apply the blood on the, uh, the doorways in uh, Egypt. And uh, hyssop was uh, used to reach up to the Savior when he was on the cross. And so we understand that this hip hyssop was... Uh, uh, utilized in a, in a ritual way, uh, medicinal slash ritual. So he says, purge me with hyssop and uh, I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. So David's recognition of the need to be cleansed by God is ever before us. Uh, David knows that without the blood of a sacrifice, there can be no cleansing of sin. 1 John 1, 6 and 7 uh, the blood of Jesus, well, it's first one, first John 1, 7, B, uh, the end of it, it says, The blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. We can go from being dirty to becoming whiter than snow. And that's the picture that we, I think we even sang that song this morning. It's Psalm 51, 9, David desires that God would hide or conceal his sins. And uh, that's verse 9, it says, Hide thy face from my sins. And blot out my iniquities. And so what David is looking at is total eradication of the sin that he has committed. Now listen, God forgives us of sin, but there's always a consequence that comes with sin. That's the, the bottom line. God will forgive you for um, doing something, uh, but that something might later cause you to have cancer or something along the way. You know, um, I'm not going to list the bads and things that people sometimes do because I'm guilty of it as well. I mean, I'm, I'm an overeater, not an overachiever. You know, <laughs> I'm one of those guys. You know, I'm good to get to the, the table, and uh, the Bible even calls gluttony a sin. I'm not sure if I'm a glutton, but I certainly find a lot of pleasure in eating. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know how to get around that other than the fact that. I was hoping to get into COVID so I could lose my taste. <laughs> but I think God said, no, I think I'm going to let you have at least one pleasure in life. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, David experiences a result of cleansing. And I broke it down in four ways so it's easier for you to understand. First, in verse 8, he says, make me to hear joy and gladness. When you confess your sin and understand its forgiveness, 
Joy returns to your life. Happy is the man who knows his sins are forgiven, the Bible says. That's the joy. There's a lot of sorrow in this life. But there's, for us as believers, there's also a lot of joy, understanding that sometimes God selects us to suffer for him. Sometimes he richly blesses us with great things. My wife and I have uh, 12 grandkids. That's a joy, right? Not when they're all together, mind you. But that's a joy. So I didn't hear that. You didn't hear that, kids. But, you know. What, well, huh? I said it is a joy to me. When it you is. It is. It is a joy. And uh, thankful for a garage. <laughs> so there's rejoicing. When you're burning up time and energy, covering your sin, all your joy is evaporating. You know, they said if you want to be a liar, you have to have a good memory to remember the lie. You know, it's better to tell the truth and not have to worry about it. And uh, the idea of uh, joy, let me hear joy and gladness. Let my bones that you have broken rejoice. Rejoicing goes into renewing. Verse 10 says, create in me a clean heart. David knows that he not only needs forgiveness, he needs a brand new heart and spirit. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. If you have trouble with carnal thoughts, this is the verse to really memorize. Because uh, by on your own, it's never going to work. You're always going to go that route. Um, when I was a teenager, uh, our youth pastor and our pastor told us to, to look at every really nice looking girl as your sister. That really puts a damper on things. Because I grew up in the 60s and 70s where girls wore mini skirts, you know, and all that stuff. And it was very difficult, you know, not to look. Not to stare, but this helped me a little bit along the way, you know, to recognize the idea that um, my my lusting is sin, and it's wrong to do that, and it's still wrong today. And as believers, we have to harness our minds and allow God's word to have His way, because it's so easily um, our our you know our old nature so easily wants to go that route. So renewing is one thing, a clean heart. A, a new spirit. Now, it's not about the Holy Spirit. It's talking about our spirit, our, our attitudes, our thoughts, our consciousness. We can elevate that and walk within the uh, parameters of the Word of God. And it'll affect you because people will say, why are you so happy when things are so bad? Well, things aren't so bad when you think about God's on the throne and one day I'm going to be in His presence. Yeah, it might be bad now, but even in this badness, my God is capable of providing for me and meeting my needs. I, there's nothing to fear. The worst thing that people fear is death. And to me, that's graduation. You know, that's me going back to the Father. So it's, the only time you should fear is when you're out of God's will. And fear that. That, that might be something to think about. So we have uh, uh, reconnecting. When we live in sin, we can sense distance from God. So that, that happens uh, with David, and his bones wax old. Verse 11, cast me not away from thy presence. i gotta, I got to really kind of dig into this, uh, maybe at another time. But uh, um, sin, God cannot look at sin. You understand that? And uh, if we live in sin, we've uh, kind of... Uh, did something in this relationship. Not God's not going to give up on us. We don't lose our salvation. But his ministry now will be of reconciliation, returning. And uh, we sang the song about uh, we're the clay and God's the potter. I've watched people make pots. I wouldn't want to be the clay. You know, because uh, he's punching the thing and getting it soft. And, you know, sometimes it doesn't work. And they remake the whole thing. And uh, I just assume avoid that part. The first New Testament, I think it's in Ephesians, Jesus says we're his workmanship, which is the same idea, you know, and uh, I, I don't want to be chiseled by God, so I think I'm going to conform. That's the attitude that I take, that uh, this reconnecting is something that I'm trying to avoid. I want to stay connected, because in verse 12, with this reconnecting with David, there was a restoration. He says, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Now, in uh, Hebrew, that word is the word for deliverance. We use salvation differently in the New Testament time period 
after the cross, but we're delivered from the uh, chains of sin, so it's interchangeable there, but I want you to understand what David was talking about. He was being restored. He was being delivered from the agony of the sin that he had committed. He was accepting this forgiveness and re reconnecting with God. And uh, the last thing, pretty close, is uh, there's a concentration that's involved. David had been convicted. He was he confessed. And now that he had been cleansed, he consecrates himself to live a, a, on a mission. He says, uh, restore the joy of my salvation and hold me with thy free spirit. Really, the uh, idea of with thy free spirit is give me a desire to obey. That's a different way of looking at it, right? But that's what it's talking about. Uh, we're not going to get a new Holy Spirit. That's the same Holy Spirit. Our consciousness now can be changed so that instead of desiring to sin, I want a desire to do right. And that's what he's saying. I want that spirit to obey. And uh, then I will teach transgressors or sinners thy ways. So David makes this big turn and is restored back to where he was as king. He was the leader of Israelites, and he was now going to promote uh, God's ways and uh, so that uh, these people that were sinners will find mercy and be changed, converted. It says, deliver me from blood guiltless, guiltiness. Um, deliver a rescue from the guilt of murder. Even David understood what he did. He didn't kind of say, well, he could have survived, you know. It's like having the guy hanging off a rope on the Grand Canyon <clears throat> and then cutting the top. Yeah, he might survive. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> that's, that's pretty much what he uh, had accomplished with Uriah. Place him in an unwinnable position. <clears throat> so he was just like guilty of the guy shooting the arrow. As a matter of fact, that's what the Bible says. And he wanted to be delivered from that guilt. Do you have any guilt? God can deliver you from that. An acknowledgement of what God accomplished on the cross frees you from that. That has been paid for, my friend. You do not have to dwell on it anymore. <clears throat> that is gone in the past. That's the wonderful thing about forgiveness. And God does not remember. Farthest from the east and the west. Tell me something, and I'll probably remember it. But only God can not know something. Uh, and he, he wipes that away. Two examples are found in the last verses here. 1350, not the last ones. <clears throat> First witnessing, David is now ready to share what he's learned. They say a lot of times, the best uh, counselors are counselors that have gone through the same thing. You know, my, my nephew was a drug addict for a while. Um, I don't know what kind of drug it was. Oh. Heroin. And uh, now he is working in a place that helps addicts. And he's really good at it because he knows what it's like to be addicted to heroin. <clears throat> so David understands not only the depths of his sin, but the depths of God's forgiveness. And he's going to be a witness. And then... Worship is restored. <clears throat> Sometimes I think people don't come to church because of guilt. They, they have sin in their life. And they come to God's house. And it's ever before them. And instead of coming and being reminded, they stay away. Where this is where you go to find forgiveness. Because God has delivered him from his guilt, David declares, My tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. Look at verse 14 and 15. O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. And, of course, for thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou desirest not burnt offering. Basically, what David was re rehearsing to us and others is, not the actual sacrifice, it's the heart behind it. The Levitical system turned into a check off the block, get the sacrifice, go home, where God was always looking for devotion and love for him through the sacrifice. 
And uh, so here we are with David. Your past sins don't disqualify you from living on a mission because your former failures can be a platform to witness and worship. You hear what I said? Your past is done. But you can build on that your memory and your understanding of how God had forgiven you, and that can excel your witness and worship. We see this in the, a lot of times in these recovery groups. You ever go to an AA meeting? I, I've never been there, but I've heard. They're not necessarily Christian, but they definitely help people with accountability and uh, all that stuff. For the believer, we should have some kind of, we do, it's all called Sunday morning where we get with God and we're hoping that God's Holy Spirit will pierce our heart, uh, get us to see, illuminate our eyes to see the truth of our lives. And then from there, uh, do what David did. Confess it and uh, enjoy the forgiveness. Uh, there's a, a contrition here that I want to leave you with. I use the phrase a lot, contrite. is the Hebrew word for crushed. And uh, uh, contrite heart he uses in verse 16 and 17. For thou desirest not sacrifice else, I would give it. Uh, 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. So the best way to be right with God is, whether it's physically or not, you get on your knees before him and plead. You know, like David did. David didn't blame anything but himself. He didn't have any excuse. He was guilty for God and uh, pled his case to God. And God wonderfully forgave him. Uh, someone wrote that the contrary heart in our terminology today would be kind of like a repentant heart. But I think contrite really kind of brings out the idea that anything in us that uh, could be in the way of this relationship needs to be crushed. Uh, just like when Jesus crushes the head of the serpent and does away with him. Um, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken contrary heart. Oh God, uh, you will not despise. And God loves a person who loves God more than your, your very self. And, uh, and totally trust in him. Uh, let's pray. Father, thank you for this time. And we're thankful, Father, that you have provided for us and uh, uh, more than likely, all of us have, uh, have difficulty sometimes with sin. And uh, we know, Father, that uh, that sin could uh, really be detrimental to our walk. So I pray that uh, the Spirit would reveal to us in our minds, our eyes, that we might just confess those sins and uh, get that joy restored and uh, anticipate serving you on a regular basis tomorrow. And doing what's right in your eyes, Father. Help us to have a good attitude. Help us to focus our attention on you. And uh, we just give you all the praise. In Jesus' precious name, amen. amen. All right, let's sing one hymn together. One more. And I believe the hymn is something. Yeah. 821. What? 821. 821. <laughs>
Thank you. 